No, it's not ringing. Hello? 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 Can, can you hear me? Hello? Yes, I can. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, talk a bit more. Oh, I'd just like to say that I think uh, that this show has uh, got a lot of potential. Yeah, we know. Okay, goodbye. On it, they probably do a good job. Thank you. I never get them to do this goddamn. Good morning. First thing this morning, let me try and set the record straight on the Trident caper. Friday morning, I interviewed the Trident people, Jerry Vavarek and others, on what was going to happen to the Trigull, this bold venture of this Canadian-made aircraft in Sydney, Vancouver Island, where 107 or 105 jobs were at stake. And on that program in the morning, we also interviewed Ron Huntington, the Tory MP who is a small business cabinet minister. And as we finished the program, we had talks going between Huntington and Vavarek with the prospect and the possibility that something might be done. Over the weekend, stories come out, black and white, print and on the air, saying that Trident had gone into bankruptcy. Not quite correct. Uh, and to get the correct version, no doubt about it, a large number of the employees were laid off Friday afternoon, but to get the version correctly and accurately, let's go right now to Jerry Vavarek, who is the Chief Executive Officer of Trident, and he's over in his office in Vancouver Island. What happened after you left here Friday, Mr. Vavarek? Well, Jack, the, uh, <clears throat> we found that uh, uh, the Trident project was being discussed at the uh, federal cabinet level between Joe Clark and uh, John Frazier and others on the cabinet level. And I learned after I got back here, Jack, that uh, the cabinet had made a decision on, the, uh, on withholding wheat to, to Russia and to support the United States in that. So I think that Trident was preempted on that agenda by international uh, on international problems. Don't confuse me. <laughs> you had a payroll to meet on the 15th. Have you been able to meet that payroll for the 15th? Yes, we paid the, uh, the workers for all the work they've done uh, through Friday and through the 15th. So have you given, how many workers um, have you given notice? We have given notice to all of the workers, which at the time was exactly 107. And you've paid them all the money's due? That's right. Have you gone into bankruptcy? Negative. We have not gone into... What did you say? I said negative. You we said have no. Not into bankruptcy, we are. We have stopped all work on the Trigall airplane project. Trident Aircraft Limited uh, is still in business. Uh, I have the doors open today. We're answering the phones and we're uh, entertaining thoughts from people on uh, on how we can use the capability that we have built up over the last year to do things other than uh, building the Trigall airplane. Well, you were talking about a nine hundred thousand dollar order from I think. Uh, one of the big American aircraft companies for parts. Yes, that's a potential thing, but it takes some money to develop that. All right, now, just I don't want to spend all morning on this this time. When you left here, there was a prospect of federal help. Is that now down the tube? Oh, no, there's a, the, I think that perhaps uh, with this drastic step that we had to take, uh, there might be some reasonable people in the government. Did you take this step particularly to Jack, John Fraser and Huntington and Clark into action? Is that, the, is that your idea? I'm sorry, Jack, I didn't hear that. Did you, did you fire these people Friday because it was the last of your money, or did you fire them to try and get some political action out of the Tories? Of course not. We, fired, uh, we didn't fire them, Jack. That's the bad uh, word. We just simply had to terminate their employment. We laid them off for the sole reason I had no more money to allow them to work. 
I would never play so cavalier with people's lives as to use them as a... All right, and you're still hopeful that Fraser and Huntington might come to your assistance by releasing the balance of the $8 million which you'd been originally promised. I'd like them to come to their senses, Jack. Fair enough. Now, what about um, the bankruptcy? You're not in bankruptcy, but Martin Lindsley, the Vancouver Chartered Accountant, has been appointed by someone to something. What is he doing in the picture now? Martin Lindsley is the, man, the trustee who has been appointed by BCDC to, as an independent uh, party to, uh, to look over our shoulder uh, during the next uh, few days to come up with a proposal to all of the people that, we, that Trident Aircraft owes money to so that everybody will be treated fairly and everybody will be paid uh, in a, at appropriate times when money does become available and that the assets that are over here don't deteriorate with time. Let me get that. BCDC has appointed Martin Lindsley as a trustee to look after your affairs prior to a potential bankruptcy. Prior to? Yeah. We don't intend to go into bankruptcy. We're simply going to uh, take a step backward and uh, find work for this uh, uh, manufacturing facility to do. Meanwhile, your only hope really is Fraser and Huntington if they come through with federal money. Well, I think it's clear that we shouldn't uh, say, think that a trusteeship is something that occurs prior to bankruptcy. That's bad. That's not true. And we don't intend to go bankrupt. We just are, are bankrupt on the, on, the, on the Trigal project. That project is now uh, dead. Uh, we can revive it, but in the meantime, Trident Aircraft Limited goes on with all of the resources that we have over here on the island. I think I understand it better. I think so. You're not in bankruptcy. You're hopeful the feds will still come to your rescue, but for the moment, there are 107 people looking for jobs in Vancouver Island this morning from the Trident plants. Jack, next Friday, you should understand this. Next Friday, the Saanich Peninsula will be $25,000 $25, poorer because we don't have payrolls to, uh, to spend their money. Thanks, Jerry Vavarek. Keep me in touch. We'll do it, Jack. Bye now. Bye now. I just wanted to get the record straight on it, because when they left here on Friday, there was still hope of some kind of federal accommodation, I had thought. They've obviously run out of cash to pay the payroll beyond the 15th. They've uh, paid the last payroll to these 105 people. Martin Lindsley is in as a financial trustee to make sure the money's in order. They're hopeful they can carry on with some production business on the spare parts side. The trigal is dead unless the feds pour in some money. Pays your money and you take your choice. The only political thing I might say is that uh, in view of the money that's been poured into industry in the East, this might be a time where the Tories did a Nelson touch and poured just a little bit into a high technology industry in the West, even if they lost the money. Next, I'm going to be dealing with money again, with three important people on how you get your slice of the $200 million provincial mortgage money at a beautiful, joyous low, next to nothing, three and a half years at nine and three quarter percent after the break. <laughs> I have in my studio this morning a distinguished panel of experts who are going to answer your questions almost right off the top about how you get your share, I'm just back from Britain, of the lolly. The lolly being $200 million worth, more or less, we'll get down to the fine detail later, of nine and three quarter percent mortgage loans from the provincial government acting in concert with the BC, with every credit union in British Columbia. I must be the first to admit that it's a, I almost said bloody good idea, but I'm not allowed to say that on television. It's a very good idea. It's just a pity it isn't, doesn't subsidize every mortgage rate across the entire country at nine and three quarter percent, but it may be a precursor to that kind of thing. So what we've got here this morning on my right, ladies and gentlemen, bloody but unbowed, Hugh Curtis, Minister of Finance in the Social Credit Government of Victoria. I wanted a civil servant who knew everything, but Hugh said he knows everything, so he came instead. Oh, oh, oh. I'll get on you my, that, Webster. On my left is Peter Potovinikov, who is, they don't have general managers anymore, chief executive officer of the BC Central, <laughs> what? Credit Union. BC Central Credit Union. And on his left is Jeffrey Hook. How do you say it? Hook. 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 Jeffrey Hook. H-double-O-K, <laughs> I say Hook. 
who is the chief executive officer of the Vancouver City Credit Union. Now, first to you, Mr. Curtis. Isn't it just a pity well, that wonderful though this scheme is, and I'm really not knocking it, because if I could get the nine and three quarter percent for a new house right now, I'd be very pleased to get it. Isn't it funny, isn't it unhappy though, that if I want to buy an old house, if it's all I can afford is a little old shack, that I can't get your cheap money? Jack, the, the, pro book, the program was designed with three things in mind, really. The forest industry and the use of British Columbia forest products the construction industry and uh, assistance to get people into housing. Uh, really, it, I think, will be seen in time as going far beyond just new homes because it's going to increase the stock of housing in British Columbia. You know better than I, I'm sure, the uh, zero vacancy rates which exist in Greater Vancouver, Greater Victoria, and in some other communities around the province. So, uh, yes, isn't it unfortunate that anyone has to pay a mortgage which is reaching for the sky, 14, 15, 16, whatever the percentage may be. We saw, however, an opportunity to do something quickly, to do it with the credit <coughs> unions in British Columbia, and to stimulate construction uh, at a time when that construction needed stimulation. And in the final analysis, it won't cost you that much out of provincial funds. No, the estimate is that uh, the subsidization will, will work out to around $24 million. That depends on the take-up. It depends on, on just what the split is All between right. I'll, uh, go on, I'll go now directly to Mr. Podovinikov. Peter, uh, what would I be paying right now for a mortgage if I could get one uh, for a new house which I want built and completed by the end of December? Okay, depending on the maturity uh, of the mortgage, uh, rewrite period, one year, three year, five year, you could be paying anywhere between 13 and a quarter and 14 and a half percent uh, in the marketplace, depending on the characteristics of the mortgage. Now, this particular mortgage that I, I may be eligible for now, what, will that be written for what period? Uh, it'll be written for a rate guarantee of up to three and a half years. Now, when we say three and a half years, the earlier that the construction can be completed, the longer period that you have. And, and all of these mortgages will be maturing on February 28, 1984. And that at that time, then it will be necessary to rewrite at current market rates at that time. February 28th, 1984. That's right. So if a person happens to get his construction completed by the end of May, he has the benefit of carrying through even for a longer, technically, uh, technically for a longer period than three and a half years. But it is three and a half years from the start of construction that will be, uh, from the last date on which construction can start. Uh, to uh, so. It, it's uh, a little bit of a longer guarantee period than is available. What in the is the yet. last date on which construction may start? <coughs> June 30th, 1980. That's the last day I can put a spade in the ground for this. That is correct. Is that the intent of the scheme? June 30, 1980 is the cutoff. Yes, that's a, that's a very <coughs> fundamental part of the program, Jack, because we wanted this to happen very quickly. And again, time was of the essence to stimulate the construction, as I indicated a few moments ago. If we uh, had permitted uh, a start uh, a year from now or 18 months from now, it would not have had the beneficial effect. How much of the 200 million must go to individual mortgages and how much for rental? Well, we have said very clearly, and the Premier in his statement last week indicated, that our breakout at the moment is 125 million for individual housing and 75 million for frame apartments. Now, that we've said right from the outset is subject to adjustment. It depends on the, the extent of the take up. I think uh, that uh, the, the uh, gentleman from the credit unions uh, would, would confirm that. We're prepared to, maybe it's 105 Switch and 95, it maybe it's 150 <coughs> and 50. We'll find out very quickly. Now I must go to Mr. Hook of Vancouver City Credit Union and ask him, what kind of response have you had? What kind of inquiries are you getting? And how do you think the 200 million will split down, uh, judging yeah. by the response? Well, on the, uh, <coughs> on the Monday, Jack, we had a team of five people in head office plus uh, 13 branches answering that phone. It went absolutely wild. And in one day, we had uh, serious requests from the billing industry for $80 million. And we had over 500 individuals who uh, were planning to build a home. That was in one day, Monday. No, no, Wednesday, uh, it'll be the day after the... Uh, it would be Wednesday. Oh, sorry. Wednesday. Wednesday. Yeah. The first yeah. day, it was a Wednesday. Yeah. 
Now, let me get this clear, though. Yeah. You said serious requests in the building industry for $80 million. Uh, these are people... Now, that $80 million has nothing to do with the $200 million, is it? Uh, these are people who said we can build houses that would qualify under this program for sale to uh, BC residents. And did they want to borrow money from you for interim financing? Well, they would, but that would be a side, uh, would be our own money, it would be nothing to do with the government. That's the point I'm making, is it not, Peter Potovinikov? If I am a builder, I can't get my hands on any of this nine and three quarter money I trust. No, no. that's right. Uh, you have to, the builder will have to arrange his own interim mm -hmm. financing. I think it's very important to stress that <coughs> the program is designed to discourage uh, speculative activity as much as possible. The program is directed at individuals who want to buy houses, new houses. And it's not first time house owners, it is just mm -hmm. owners of new homes. It's uh, so. If you own a house now and if you want to sell it and you want to build another house, certainly you will be eligible so yeah. long as you conform with the other guidelines. All right, just a minute. If I don't want to sell a home I'm in, if I just want to get in on the nine and three quarter money and build it speculatively, can I still go to the credit union for my nine and three quarter money? Well, you'll have to move into that house, otherwise yeah. it won't qualify. <coughs> That's correct. Owner occupied. <coughs> Owner occupied in the in the ownership aspect of the program is is very yeah. fundamental. And uh, there's, there's no way around that. We look to the credit unions to, uh, to protect us in that respect. That's, a very, that's two important points. If I'm a builder, I must get my interim financing from my normal sources in yeah, my whatever. normal way. Yes. Right. And if I'm a buyer, I must move into that house before you'll give me the nine and the quarter money. That's correct. But unlike other programs which are government operated, and that's a distinction you may want to explore later, yeah. uh, this is not a first ownership situation. Again, there are the three aspects of the program. To get houses built, to increase the stock, to use BC products, and to get right. people into ownership. That's right. And I would think, it's, it's speculation on my part, but I, I would think that, uh, Jack, a number of the people who will take advantage of this will be first home, first time owners, but it isn't a requirement. How about the practical difficulties, gentlemen? Mm -hmm. You're dealing with yeah. builders all the time. Of if I decide now that I want a house, can I really go out and find a builder who isn't already conducting a scheme? It, uh, <clears throat> it uh, obviously would mean that if I was building 20 houses and I got eight built, that I'm going to have to either buy those mortgages down and sell them to you with a nine and three quarter mortgage, or else I'm not going to sell them. And then I'm going to go on to my other new houses and they would qualify for the government mortgage. Interestingly, Jack, on the weekend, uh, we've already got builders offering nine and three quarter percent mortgages on their houses. And the reason is, and I think Premier Bennett mentioned this, that we would get a ripple effect that you would find in the marketplace they would have to compete with this program. So there are houses out there right now where the uh, builder is what we call buying down the interest rate to nine and three quarters. And uh, there's very little stock, actually, of new houses on the market. That's what I was going to say. There's not much in the very, way of new houses no. on the, the estimates, Yeah, the estimates we received when we were, we were speaking with Hudak uh, about this, and I think it's been confirmed by others, uh, is that probably 500 to 600 uh, homes on the yeah. shelf, as it were, in British Columbia. Does this go for condominiums, too, by the way, gentlemen? Yes, yes as long it as does. it's strata title, so you own it and you occupy it. Not cooperative. Uh, there's no reason why a cooperative couldn't be considered so long as they, uh, because cooperative is a form of strata condo uh, a title anyway. What about leased land? Yes. Yeah. City, okay. city of Vancouver, Champlain yes, Heights. Yes, I, I noticed there was comment over the uh, weekend with respect, specific respect to uh, Champlain Heights. Yeah. Now that uh, that depends on the availability of the money. We can't we can't suggest that every available lot in Champlain Heights will be uh, will be covered by this program mm. because uh, clearly that would be more than is allocated for that particular part of Metro Vancouver but I, I, I do want to say uh, that leased land will apply because it will be assessed or appraised if you will at uh, fee simple and then it, it's an ownership situation in terms of a long-term lease uh, 99 right. years. Okay I gentlemen think. what we're going to do now is we're going to take a break we're going to come back and we're going to go to the phones and we're going to pick short, sharp, succinct calls <laughs> on specific details of the plan. You can knock it politically later in the program if you like. At the moment, I want the calls on the details of whether or not you're going to try and get one and what you want to know about it. 
after the break. I must give you two credit union guys a nasty question, even if you are now chief executive officers. How come, how can you protect that uh, ordinary people who are not members of credit unions yet will get a fair crack of the whip that they won't just all go on the old buddy system? I've been a member of the credit union for a long while. I want my crack of the money. Well, Jack, certainly that's a concern. We've already on several occasions uh, circulated this information to our credit unions. Keep in mind that uh, the marketplace is going to have to uh, 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 work effectively here because credit unions can ruin their own reputation if, in fact, they uh, do show preference to any segment because there is not enough money to go around. And so we've encouraged them to uh, take care not only of their members, but anybody who is a, who is a person that comes off the street who has can not I dealt previously. Can I come into Vancouver City mm -hmm. Savings Credit Union, put in a $5 deposit, and qualify for an application for a mortgage at nine and three quarters? You can come in and you have to subscribe for $25 in shares and uh, that money is returned to you if you ever leave and you get dividends on it and uh, yes you can. Right away? Yeah. I don't have to be voted into membership of the credit union? You're accepted right there and it's... When I come and apply for my mortgage I can join the credit union at the same time? Right. <coughs> so I'm paying a $25 fee and I might become a willing member later on. Well, it's not so much a fee, Jack. It's your money. It's always yours. You get a dividend. But you know it. what I'm getting yeah. at. Jack, the right. point I want to make though is that uh, every credit union has a different procedure in this respect and in some credit unions you may have a waiting yes. period of up to a week to have membership approved, but we've encouraged those credit unions to do it on the spot. Because you didn't be accused of discrimination. That's correct. Now, is it all going to go to Vancouver where the builders are jumping into action? No. What about Push Coupe? No, we, uh, fundamental to the program was to, uh, in dealing with the credit unions, to ensure, and they responded very quickly and, and very positively in this respect, that the money be allocated on a population pro rata basis. So uh, it, uh, it, I think yeah. is therefore yes. as easy. It should be as easy to attend uh, to obtain a mortgage in Dawson Creek as in uh, Vancouver or uh, Victoria. Jack, Jeff. Jack, we've uh, we've looked at the province. We've broken the province down into about six uh, regions, and uh, taken the population numbers in each of these regions, allocated dollar amounts, and we've then within these regions allocated uh, dollar amounts to individual credit unions. And we're also indicating that anybody who cannot conveniently get to a credit union should contact us at BC Central Credit Union and we'll make sure that they get equitable treatment. If they're not within range of somewhere, come to you directly. That, in, yeah. in very few instances, that may be the case, but generally we're covered pretty well in the province. Are you happy with the take you're getting from the government? How much you get to work on? No, we're never happy with the amount that we get on, but uh, on the other hand, if the government took the initiative to provide low interest, then we have to play our part. We're going to get one and one half percent margin. We'll pay them eight and one quarter percent. We can charge no more than nine and three quarter percent. Is that what you do with your own members' money too? How much are you taking your own members' money? Uh, generally, we try to operate on margins that are higher than that. Somewhere in the area of two to two and a half percent uh, is what we like to get. But on this kind of a program, we won't lose, but we won't make. I think I should go straight to the yeah, calls. Sure. Hugh, when you're answering the phone calls, that's your camera to talk to. When you two are answering the phone calls, that's your camera oh, to talk okay. to. Fine. Yeah. Makes people feel they're being of course. personally you. spoken to. Go ahead, please. Uh, hello, Jack. I'm wondering if I receive a mortgage at nine and three quarters and pay it off before the three year period is up, will I be penalized at all in that? Can I pay the, the mortgage off within the three year period without uh, getting penalized? Yes, you will be penalized to the extent of a three month interest penalty. You certainly can pay it off, however. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, please. Good morning, gentlemen. Morning. Apparently, uh, this program, including the mortgage and the property, cannot exceed $95,000. Is that correct? That is correct. Now, in my particular case, they are property is valued at uh, forty thousand dollars. Does that mean I can go in, show the plans, because I am contracting my own home? And does that mean I get the difference? Uh, in other words, I get fifty-five thousand dollars to uh, build my home? <laughs> no, I I wouldn't think so. And I think Jack, at this point, if I may respond to the caller, what we're using here are the normal mortgage policies developed by the credit unions in British Columbia. No, I didn't understand his question at all. 
Yeah. Well, I He's got he, property worth $40,000. I think I yes. can answer it. Uh, yep. Uh, but uh, he can't use the difference. He can't, he can't take advantage <coughs> right. of the difference. All right. We'll give it to Mr. Hook. Okay. Uh, the normal policies are he comes in and he has a value for his lot. Let's say it's uh, 40000 And he brings in a plans that have to be approved, of course, by the municipality. And let's say he said, I'm going to build this house uh, for 50000 That's a total of 90000 So he gets a mortgage on a $90,000 home. <laughs> And uh, the construction obviously can't exceed the difference between the land value and ninety-five thousand dollars, and it has to be a finished house. But the the amount of the mortgage will will be a percentage of the end value of the land and building. All right. What will his mortgage be? How how do you decide how much of that ninety thousand dollars he will get in the form of a mortgage from Land City Credit Union? I know that's okay. a very uh, very can, elementary yeah, question. No, but, but he can have three. Uh, <laughs> there are three types of loans. He can have uh, what we call a conventional, which everyone's used to, which is seventy five percent of the appraised value of his, of his land and house. Right. The total thing. Or he can go for a high ratio mortgage. In other words, he said, "Hey, I haven't gotten twenty five percent down." And under that case, we would insure that mortgage. He could get as high as seventy-nine thousand five hundred. On ninety thousand. Right. So he would get nearly eighty thousand dollars. So he'd have to put fifteen thousand five hundred down. Now he can get uh, perhaps qualify for the other government programs, if it's a case of a person on his first home. And I think the minister's got. Well, the, no. Before we yeah, come to that, right. though, what are the criteria mm -hmm. you use to decide okay. whether I've got to put down twenty-five percent? Or uh, it's how much your earnings about. are. It's my earning capacity. Can you afford it? Uh, and you'll decide that. Uh, let me give you an example, Jack. That uh, let's say you come in for that house and you say, "Fine, I want to borrow seventy thousand dollars." Right. Uh, and your monthly payment would be uh, on this program nine and three quarters at twenty-five years, six hundred and fifteen dollars a month. Mm -hmm. And then we allow, say, sixty-five dollars a month taxes. Mm -hmm. So you have a total of six hundred and eighty dollars a month. Mm -hmm. Now, if you and your spouse between you make about $2,200 a month, you can qualify. If we don't, we don't. If you don't, you don't. Then you'd have to get a lower mortgage. You'd have to get a lower mortgage. Mm -hmm. uh, we allow the spouse, uh, husband and wife, to put 100% of both salaries in there, providing she's got a, and he's got a reasonably uh, secure job. All right. Now, you mentioned the other government programs. Do you want to tell us about that, Hugh? <coughs> well, yeah. I think that, uh, Jack, uh, it's important to understand that we're not excluding those who qualify under this program from existing government programs. That's uh, a grant for first home buyers. It's $1,000 or $2,500, depending on whether there is a dependent child under 19, uh, and the BC government second mortgage loan. So one of the first considerations we had when we were thinking about this was, do we exclude the other programs? And clearly we should not. That's unfair. So a second mortgage. Uh, could be a uh, government second mortgage yeah. could be computed into the uh, into the figures which uh, which you've been given just How a few months ago. How much is that government second? It's five thousand. How much is it at? Oh. Eleven and seven. Uh, no, no, it's uh, thirteen and a half. Oh, yeah. Well, it's a second. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, over twenty-five years. It also has some. It's twenty-five years, and it has some. Uh, Price limits, yeah. which uh, which are designed to help us into those the, into in the, the lower affordable level. housing, the affordable housing yeah. field. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Well, I don't think we need to complicate that. But for those yeah. who are eligible, the right yeah. price limits, right. the government second is still available. Yes, and it's available right. really as part of a down payment in certain circumstances. Right. And in effect, we lend them the money till they get the money from the government. Breath, you're doing very well, gentlemen. Just hold your collective breaths, as I shall do mine during this commercial break. <laughs> Two big wheels from the credit unions. Hugh Curtis, Ministry of Finance. Question. I noticed when Mr. Hoke was telling me about provincial approval for license, municipal approval for licenses, you're going to, you may get a whole, your municipalities may just be swamped with applications for building permits, licenses, and approval, both in the individual purchase and in the rental duplex scheme. Well, I think, uh, Jack, that probably some will be swamped. Uh, the capability is there. My colleague Bill Vanderzom is Minister of Municipal Affairs and he's more likely to use the carrot uh, than the stick. I would personally, and I'm speaking uh, as an individual, I would use the stick if I learned that municipalities were uh, dragging their feet or 
uh, discussing the program in terms of, of uh, capital P politics. I think that it's important for municipalities to say, okay, the government has taken an initiative here. It is important for the three factors of the economy which we have discussed, and uh, we're going to get these permits and approvals through as quickly as we can. I would expect municipalities to respond in that way. If they don't, then I would, uh, as one, I would want to uh, There may be rezoning some needed in some places. Yes, there would be for rental, perhaps. And again, I think that uh, if a municipality really wants to help the province, the people of British Columbia, uh, they can do so very quickly. Go ahead, please. Yes, uh, last week there was an announcement that mobile homes would qualify under this program. Uh, talking about affordable housing, will this also cover mobile homes that go into rental mobile home parks? Uh, yes, Jack, it will cover mobile homes that can go into mobile home parks. The mobile home will have to have uh, been constructed after January 15th. Construction on that will have to have started yeah. since that date. And, uh, but then, yes, these can be parked in mobile home parks. And manufactured in B.C., of course. And yeah. Yes, naturally. That goes without saying. Perhaps. Just a minute. I can't buy a mobile <laughs> home unless I get a certification from the plant that it was built yeah. after January the 15th. Is that correct? Correct. And yeah. that is very easy to obtain because with the mobile home registry in the Ministry of Lands, Parks, and Housing, uh, there is, uh, that, that process is available and it can be determined quite, quite easily. And you mortgage them without any question at all? We've been doing it all along, and be no question. I think one of the things we mustn't forget is this residency, Jack, that you must be living in oh, British yeah. Columbia two years, or you must have lived in B.C. five years previously, and you've come back. Can that be a cumulative five years? Well, uh, uh, I, would, I would think it, has, it is, yes, uh, it, because it's, it's essentially for those people who've been transferred out of British Columbia in the course of, mm -hmm. of their work. Uh, I'm subject to correction. I'm sorry to hedge on this one, but I think mm. it can be two years and three two years. Year, well, yeah. why not? Yeah. Two yeah. years yeah. and three years is so. just as good as five yeah. years. And <laughs> okay, thank you. Lady Smith, go ahead, please. Hi, first question. Are these mortgages transferable? No. no. No, Jack, they are not transferable because if we were to make them transferable, that would open up uh, speculation and we just don't want to do that. Not transferable, except in case of death, I presume. Uh, they have to be paid out. That's what I was worried about. Oh, they have to be paid out. Of course, somebody dies, you sell the house. You'd refinance. You'd, you would refinance. You'd lose it. the nine and three quarter percent mortgage. A widow could take it over, though. Uh, if she were eligible. Well, uh, if it was the wife of the, uh, presumably they'd be jointly owned, mm -hmm. so she would carry on with the nine and three quarter percent. Good question. Next one is Houston, British Columbia. Go ahead, please. Yes, we have acreage that is outside of a town municipality. Can we qualify for the nine and three quarter percent plan? Uh, so long as you build a house on it in which you intend to live. Uh -huh. And um, can we build it ourselves, or do we have to hire a builder to build it? Mm -hmm. you, uh, you could build it yourself, but then the, you will have to be careful that the end value of land and house will not exceed $95,000 at the end of your construction. And the construction must be completed uh, by December 31, 1980. Mm -hmm. By the end of this year, then, the construction would have to be completed. That's correct. That's correct. Yeah. Okay, fine. Thank you very much. Go ahead, please. Hello. Uh, this, this plan, attacking the sickness instead of preventing the sickness, the real problem is serviced lots. And there's lots of infill land, and they could make service lots at cost. And the problem is the municipalities, they only get $600 per residential house for taxes, whereas it cost them about eight to $900 per residential family. Therefore, they operate always against having residential development. They want commercial and industrial development. So the real well, problem is the service lots, not the mortgages. <coughs> well, uh, the first part of your, of your statement I, I accept as having some validity. There is a shortage of serviced land, but I think you're misinformed, sir, with respect to the, uh, what a municipality receives uh, for residential uh, construction, because there is a very generous program existent in British Columbia now uh, with respect to housing units. And that's a direct transfer payment from the provincial government to local government uh, for the construction of, of those, those uh, accommodations. And uh, I, I think that uh, municipalities uh, would admit themselves that they do <coughs> receive that kind of funding and it's pretty generous. Go ahead, please. Good morning, gentlemen. We have made a deposit on a property at Champlain Heights in the Park Lane subdivision. Uh, our particular unit has not started yet, although the rest or parts of the development have started. Mm. Would we perhaps qualify? Yeah. Mm. 
Jeffrey Hook, Vancouver City, uh, Cred City Savings Credit Union. Mr. Hook will answer your question. Uh, I, uh, I think it's possibly one of the group where we have already committed to do the financing. And uh, uh, I think we would have to examine the indi individual merits of your particular project. If the lot itself is a legally separate lot uh, and it has not been started, then I would think there's hope that you would qualify. Yes. Thank you very much. There's going to be some heart burning about those who qualify and those who don't in separate yeah. cases, isn't there? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think we all went into the program, Jack, recognizing yeah. that uh, there would be some questions which were not anticipated and some uh, problems or unique situations which were not foreseen. But again, time is of the essence. That was made clear last week, and it's important to restate that. Might you push it beyond the $200 million? No, it is a one-time only program. That's the way we conceived it, and that's the way we're, uh, we're functioning now. Go ahead, please. Good morning, gentlemen. My question deals with availability of these homes. Assuming that I have not the transportation to get around to find out where these homes are built, can I come and contact the credit union and say, I would like to be able to purchase one of these homes? Will they keep an inventory of the availability of these homes? Jack, I think it's important to point out to the gentleman that there is not an inventory of these homes and that he should contact his credit union yeah and indicate that he has a desire to, uh, to purchase or build a home under this program. I'm sure that the credit unions can direct them to suitable builders uh, or uh, to uh, land that might be available for this purpose. That's a kind of pie in the sky answer, but hopefully you're right. Uh, I hope so. <laughs> Webster, Hugh Curtis, did I do that? Yeah. Webster, Hugh Curtis, Minister of Finance, Jeffrey Hook, Vancouver City Savings Credit Union, and Peter Bartovinikov of the BC Central Credit Union. After the break. One of uh, the reporters in BC TV News Hour just told me just now that he went into Surrey Credit Union on Saturday thinking about putting in an application. He was told he'd better get cracking because three million of their six million dollar has already been unofficially put aside for people who have applied. Mm -hmm. And that he better get his application in or by Wednesday he may not be able to get any of that six million dollars. Yeah. Now, what, that doesn't sound right to me. Well, uh, we've had to develop the rule, Jack, so that first come, first served. And uh, what has happened is that when people come in, we keep a log that when you come in, and you say, look, I've got a lot and I want to build a house, and we take your name, the date you, you did that. And we did that last week, and I presume they're doing the same he thing. He was told he'd have to have a, a plan in within a week. Well, I don't know what they have done. Uh, we know that's uh, maybe impractical. So that what we're seeing is that we would then call you back in and say, right, we want serious indication that you, in fact, can follow through with your plans. Otherwise, we would have unallocated funds. You happy with that, Hugh? Well, I, I think that uh, it, it's, my wife and I have uh, built one house, actually. That's, uh, that's the only time we were involved. But we identified a builder. Uh, we weren't under this time of kind of time constraint, but we identified a builder. Uh, we looked at the plans uh, he had and, uh, and, and the kind of housing he was doing, and we made our decision very quickly. Uh, again, I, I've said it, uh, time is all important here. The demands of the marketplace mm. may sort that mm. out for itself. I think so, They Jack. will to a certain extent, yeah. yeah. Uh, just to illustrate that point, I was telling you that last week we had over 500 individuals phone us and say, look, I've got a lot and I've been going to build my house, can I get one of those mortgages? And we said, fine, leave your name, etc. Now that's just the first week. And so we would anticipate that all those people will be brought in and we will determine whether or not they can follow through on their... I don't want to create alarm and despondency, but it's going to be a race for those who pick their plans, get their lot, and get in to see you as quickly as possible, well, which is part of your object. It's, yes, it it's is. A, it's a immediate program. Go ahead, please. Yes, I'm a builder. Let's say I have three homes on my hands right now, and I also took a permit out in October, and then the interest rose, 60% I didn't build it. Would I qualify in that home right now for this low interest which I took a permit out in October? Which home? I, know, I, I haven't built it. You haven't built it? 
You haven't sold it. You haven't built it. I haven't built it. I just yeah. delayed we, it. Well, we, uh, we've considered this very carefully, and uh, the issuance of a building permit before the program was announced uh, should not, uh, in this particular uh, gentleman's case, should not interfere with his ability to find someone who will buy that house when it is constructed. And I think that we've worked it out with the credit unions as well, that uh, the building permit may have been issued in November of 1979. But as long as no construction has commenced on that lot, then uh, it, it would apply. And that's the only retroactivity that can be permitted in this program. A building permit is in effect for uh, a, a good long time. And it, at the time of the mortgage being finalized, I understand that the credit union uh, people would site inspect and determine that construction has not commenced and that it would qualify. Jack, there is a, there's a fine point here that uh, this man has a, a lot and he presumably has a, a plan that he can build approved by the municipality. And what he has to do, of course, he's got to make sure he qualifies and he can do that by coming to talk to us or a credit union. But secondly, he has to then go out and find a buyer. He doesn't get the nine and three quarter percent mortgage. Right but he can get an interim financing from us and then he has to advertise that look, this house qualifies and then if a buyer comes along uh, then that person would get the nine and three quarter mortgage. He can start the house today advertise that he's got a house that qualifies right. on the go right. and sell it as best he can exactly to he somebody who qualifies. Right. He can't start the house today it's a fine point he starts he can 15th. start the house 15th. tomorrow tomorrow okay January 15th. How about uh, how about the other three homes that I got in my hands? What I do with them? Are they already built? Yes. No, we, we agonized over this one, and it's very much like any other change in government policy, whether it's at the local level or the provincial level or the federal level, there has to be a cutoff. Now, this program, I think the, the calls this morning and our conversation suggest that it's going, to, uh, it's going to be taken up very quickly. It's accelerated. It's going very fast. And so those builders who have an inventory of two homes or four homes or, or more, mm -hmm. uh, those houses do not qualify because they don't meet the two, two of the criteria, which is construction now and use of British Columbia materials now. This is part of the problem which we identified. And uh, once you get into a retroactivity in terms of uh, the stage of construction, has it, was it started last week? Was it started a year mm -hmm. ago? Retroactivity yeah. just creates horrible problems. Do I get problems. this guy right? He's got three houses yeah. built and unsold. Yes, yeah. and we recognize that before the program was finalized. Uh, it's going to be difficult in the short term. But again, this should be seen, I think, as a signal to, we hope, the federal government, whichever it may be, and perhaps to other lending institutions, that something yeah. has to be done about the housing industry and, uh, if you will, subsidizing mortgages to get people into housing. Now, just, to, just let me take a second with this builder. These three houses are already built, right? Correct, yeah. What do they sell for? Well, they're supposed to sell for 58000 in the district I am in. And what mortgage interest will that go at? Well, about 14%, 13 3 quarter. Mm -hmm. I haven't got a mortgage, existing mortgage on it now. It's, it's yeah. financed by interim now? It's an interim financing. Yeah. Uh, my only suggestion is to do, as builders are already starting to do, uh, is take your lumps by buying down the mortgage to a lower rate. It doesn't necessarily have to be nine and three quarters. It has to be low enough so that buyers can qualify. This is the problem with the high interest rates, that many people cannot qualify with their salaries for the mortgage. Okay, you're okay on one. Victoria, go ahead, please. Uh, I have a house that will be paid for uh, next year. Would I be eligible for this program uh, and also be able to retain my old house for income purposes and provide that I follow the stipulation yeah. by moving in to the new house uh, as has been mentioned because I'm sure there are a lot of people like myself mm -hmm would like to get out of this house. Okay, we've got the message. Yeah. Uh, yes, madam, you certainly will qualify. You, you can keep your existing house as long as you build a house that you intend to, that you will move into by the end of the year. Uh, question number two, this will be a shorty. Uh, considering all the strikes in the construction industry, would the, uh, should a strike occur during the building of any of these houses, will that automatically extend the time limit? In the program to date, there's been no provision for that. Well, I would suggest you do, because we're the most strike-bound province in the country. 
Uh, well, I think uh, I, I can't speak for, uh, for any uh, trade union, but... Uh, Most I, housing construction, you may be happy or unhappy to know, is non-union. Much, much of it is. It's uh, small firms, uh, members of uh, various organizations. In fact, when building construction men go out on strike from their organizations, they <laughs> generally go work on non-union housing schemes. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. A break with Curtis, <laughs> Hook, and Bodovinikov. <laughs> Yeah, that's... Personalities, that... Mm. Good calls, gentlemen. Hugh Curtis, uh, Jeffrey Hook, and Peter Podovinikov. Up to their necks in $200 million for the mortgage. Not a word about rentals. Let's leave that unless it comes up naturally. Just a minute. Two sixes where? Powell River. Go ahead, please. Uh, Mr. Webster, uh, I have a question on eligibility for the two years. Uh, does a person have to have been in the province uh, for the past two years, or does previous, previous residency in the province count? Yes, it does. That's where we turn to the uh, to existing uh, policies which are in place with respect to the uh, government uh, assistance. So Just a minute. Two years, years two years continuance. No. Two years continuous. continuous. Yes. <coughs> or five years. Yes. Cumulative. Yes. Five years. Yeah. Okay. And the other one is uh, for your person to uh, sort of contract out his own home with subcontracting. Uh, with the can your person get an open mortgage to build? Well, um, just to answer that one, uh, when you're building your own home in the interim stage, you would have an interim financing loan. When it's completed then you would either opt for this program, which is a uh, closed mortgage, at least it's open, but you can pay out with a three-month penalty, or you would have to go for, say, uh, like Van City, we have a 14% one-year open mortgage, which you can opt out in whole or in part anytime you want. In other words, if you're building your own home, you've got to finance the construction yourself. You can't right. do it on draws from you people. Well, we will, we will finance the draws on home construction, but it, it would have to be properly organized and not just sort of a weekend uh, project. Oh, I Jack, see. I encountered a couple of inquiries over the weekend uh, at home, as a matter of fact. Uh, this isn't a three-and-a-half-year mortgage. No. I think it's important also to explain that. It's a three-and-a-half-year rate. Uh, the mortgage is, uh, again, the conventional length of 20, uh, 25 years, whatever. It's uh, yeah. whatever is in other uh, words your payments are based on a 25-year repayment schedule yeah yes right. so it's it's uh, very very similar to that which has existed whether interest rates are high or at average or low uh, there is a, frequently the right of the person who is lending the money to within a year or two and I think there are some one-year mortgages in yeah. existence now Most of one year two years five years whatever mm -hmm. to alter the rate at that time so I don't want anyone to misunderstand and think that this has to be paid off in three and a half no, years. No, no. That's not the case. You'll carry it for we 25 years if you course. have to. Of course we will. But we'll the be happy to. the changes at the end of three, three and, and a half, half years. years that's yeah. Right. Yeah, even I understand that. I Go ahead, please. Well, I'm planning on building a house out in Clearbrook. Should we go to our credit union in Burnaby, or should we open another membership at a credit union in Clearbrook? Mm -hmm. Go to where your existing membership is. You uh, probably know the people and are comfortable dealing there. You've got a credit record established with them. I say by all means, go to where you're established. Okay. Thank you. Okay. These are good questions. Good listeners, mind you. Good viewers. Go ahead, please. Uh, yes. You're saying that you have to have interim financing and that the nine and three quarter percent mortgage does not start until the house is finished. But do you apply for the nine and three quarter percent mortgage before you start construction? Like, are you guaranteed yes. of that? Yes, uh, that's a very good question because uh, in, the, in formalizing the application, the credit union will issue a commitment to have funds available to you uh, once the construction is completed. Then all you will have to ensure is that the house is completed by December 31. But uh, the credit union will formally commit itself once you have finalized your negotiation with them. Okay, one more question, please. Um, we are moving probably at the end of February to an interior town, and I wonder how I could apply when we're not there yet. Well, you can... Uh, I think you know, uh, uh, that's, a, that's a good question. I think probably the best thing you could do is uh, uh, 
talk this over with your credit union, or on the other hand, maybe we at BC Central will be able to handle that mortgage uh, in a new location. But you uh, should move fairly rapidly to uh, find land and find the location in the interior community that you're going to. But perhaps this is where we at BC Central Credit Union can assist. Well, that's, of course, where I get frightened by my friend's experience at Surrey, where they said, yeah. we've already got three million unofficially allocated. Well, Jack, can we ask the caller where she's moving to? Castlegar. Well, why don't you write to the Castlegar Credit Union, Castlegar, BC, and start to get your name <coughs> uh, or phone better, them. Better still, uh, phone them, yeah. Jack, I would suggest you phone them. There are two credit unions that operate in the Castlegar area. Kootenay Savings Credit Union has a branch in Castlegar, and Castlegar Savings Credit Union also is mm -hmm. situated in Castlegar. I would contact both credit unions, indicate your plans, and, um, and discuss it with them. Webster, Curtis, Hook, and Potovinikoff. Wish I was called Jack Potovinikoff. <laughs> After the break. I'm attempting with my guests to make clearer to those who are interested how the $200 million mortgage money at nine and three quarters percent is going to work. Construction of houses starting tomorrow must be finished and owner occupied by the end of the year to qualify for the three and a half year rate of nine and three quarter percent. Although as you cut us around it as the credit union will carry it for 25 years at the going rates thereafter. And hopefully one day they'll be down to reasonably cheap levels. Questions again. Your questions have been good. Please keep them short, sharp, and succinct. S-U-C-C-I-N-C-T. <laughs> Go ahead, please. Oh, Jack. Yes. Um, I own five acres, and I applied, and they disqualified me. Applied for what? They dis, uh, due to the fact they took into consideration the assessed value of the five acres. What is the value? What is the value? Uh, $80,000. Yeah, unsubdivided. So you'd have to build a house for $15,000. That's the problem, eh? Well, that's fair, isn't it? Jack, there's, there's many alternatives. Unless it's a five-acre minimum subdivision, then what you have to do is uh, subdivide off sufficient for a building lot, and then that portion will be separate and valued on its own. But that's, that's, he, he's got a problem of having too much value in his land, that's all. That's correct. Well, it's a very large piece. Is it, uh, is, it, is it capable of being subdivided or are there restrictions, sir? Well, first of all, does he need a house? He has a fancy house in Vancouver, don't you? Yes. See, I knew you had. <laughs> He's just trying to make a buck. <laughs> Go ahead, please. Hello, sir? Yes. Uh, if I buy a trailer by myself... There's feedback there. Yeah. Go on. If I buy a trailer by myself, uh, if I want to buy a condominium, Am I still eligible for a uh, homeowner's grant? No, sir, you're all mixed up. I'm not going to bother with your call. You want a trailer, a condominium, and a homeowner grant, we'll dispose of him. Okay. You may have lost a vote, but I've lost a nuisance <laughs> caller. You Go ahead, viewer, please. Yeah. Yes, in regards to the call the man made who had uh, $40,000 tied up in a lot, wanted to know how they arrived at the value uh, of the home. Well, the, basically, what they normally do is they appraise the actual plans. That's right. To decide. And when he asked that, I didn't feel that he really got, you know, uh, the answer was just too vague. All right, Mr. Hook and Mr. Potovinikov will give you again. Well, maybe I can start and Jeff can finish. Uh, $40,000 uh, value for land. If you had a conventional mortgage, then 75% of that value is eligible for mortgage. You could then take the additional $55,000 that's available for a building of a house, and you could take 75% of that value for, for a standard conventional mortgage. So the mortgage on a $95,000 maximum value could then amount to 75% of $95,000. Or if you went high ratio, it could be a higher amount, probably somewhere up to $80,000 against that. Now what's wrong with that answer? That answer's clear. That answer's clear, thank you very much. Go ahead, please. Uh, I too am a builder, uh, as the other caller was, and I'd like to just throw out a couple statistics for you and uh, get Mr. Curtis's and Mr. Uh, Hook's reaction. It was uh, very nice of Mr. Hook to tell us to take our lumps now on homes that we have existing. Uh, I build in Richmond. In December of 79, 66 building permits were issued. Uh, up to the 11th of January, 23 more were issued for a total of 89. If half of those homes were spec homes, what does uh, Mr. Hook uh, and uh, Mr. Curtis suggest we do uh, with the homes that fall within this uh, price range of under $95,000 
that we have had to go out and get uh, spec building mortgages at uh, up to 14 percent. Now, yeah, Mr. Hook says, you know, buy them down. We build into our uh, cost yeah. when we're estimating <coughs> uh, building costs mm -hmm. uh, a little profit for ourselves, not a great deal in the new housing market. Well, I, I appreciate and, uh, You know, Sorry. another two, three, four thousand dollars of our little profit to buy the rate down. Well, I appreciate, Jack, that uh, many builders, virtually all builders uh, in, the, in the housing, residential industry, are operating on a pretty narrow margin. I uh, take your lumps was uh, not my statement, but I think I understand the problem that uh, these builders face. We have discussed this with Hudak, and we're aware of that problem. If this program were going to be in place for a long time, uh, and thus effectively freezing uh, existing housing which is completed or nearing completion, then I think the concern for the builder with an inventory would be greater. Again, uh, we looked at it as objectively as we possibly could, and we saw no way in which to go retroactively. And uh, so I think that with the program changing, taking place, and obviously going very quickly, uh, that uh, that inventory should not be left uh, un <coughs> unpurchased for some time. It should be unpurchased for up until, uh, well, into the next next year, because people that, that, no. are, that are applying to build now and start construction within uh, the next uh, six months, five and a half months, okay, and completed by December 31st, our houses could virtually sit on the market from now yeah. until uh, December. I'd, I'd like to respond because I think that the projections in terms of the numbers of units, whether they're rental or ownership, which will be provided by this program, uh, is certainly not 100 percent, not 75 percent of the total number of starts projected for this year. So I, I disagree with you, sir. Mind you, I can see his problem. No. Mr. Hook oh, wanted yeah. to say something. Uh, Jack, I just want to add something. I'm not unsympathetic to the builder. I'm in business just like he is, and you do take your lumps sometimes, even when you don't deserve it. What I'm seeing is uh, the housing units are going to be roughly 2,000 for the whole province of British Columbia. Uh, this year, we're expected to have about 25,000 new housing units, so they'd be less than 10% of the total. So the, uh, You're the talking about under the scheme? It's only 10% of the houses to be built this year will be under this scheme. And therefore, they won't have a much more than Exclusive a short, apartments. swift Exclusive impact. Apartments, yeah. Could we have not have got the same results as far as what the government was trying to achieve by making it retroactive? Because these new homes that are on the market right now, what we're trying to do as well as, as is encourage builders, which I'm building in the wintertime, I'm paying my big buck out to try to keep the industry moving. And I think you made a, a mistake there? The no. We have not got the same result by saying, okay, here's some new homes. Let's encourage the people to get out and buy them by giving the nine and three quarter money on any existing home that falls under the 95,000? No, I don't think that, uh, that, that we made a mistake, Jack, to answer your question. I don't think we could have achieved the same result because uh, we want the construction stimulated now and we want the use of British Columbia products uh, stimulated now. Again, if, if it was a program which was going to be around for 18 months, uh, then I would think that there's real validity in the caller's concern. But it's going to be a much shorter period than that. And uh, mm -hmm. it's already been observed that there's a significant uh, amount of starts which are not going to be covered by this plan. Will you be able to build under the new plan, do you think, Builder, or are you stuck with these three things? Well, I, I, I can probably build under the new plan only from the point of view that I've got some, uh, some pretty good resources behind me that will allow me to do that to offset some of my lumps that I'm going to take on the homes I've got going. Okay, I hope you don't have to take them too viciously. My thanks to Peter Podovinikov, the Chief Executive Officer of BC Central Credit Union, Mr. Jeffrey Hook of Vancouver City Savings, and what's your credit union? Oh, <laughs> Social Credit <laughs> Credit Union. <laughs> Hugh Curtis, Minister of Finance. I think we added some information for people. Jack, thank you for giving us the opportunity. There's going to be problems to iron sure. out. There's going to be jealousies. Yeah. There's going to be trouble. Yeah. There are going to be accusations that you credit yeah. union people are giving it only to your yeah. friends. Yeah. You're going to have to watch your back for the daggers and only yeah. laugh when it really hurts. Jack, the alternative would have been to do nothing. And that is unacceptable. Well, it's certainly a change for your government. Thank you. My thanks to Mr. Curtis, Mr. Podovinikov, <laughs> and Mr. Hope. You always want the last word, don't I you? I certainly do. The very last one after the break. <laughs>
going too far too fast. Ion Christensen, or is it Christensen? Christensen. Christensen is from Whitehorse. I almost said Whitehorse, British Columbia, which would have <laughs> caused the <laughs> Anik B satellite to collapse and explode. From Whitehorse. And w were a commissioner in the territory in the what? You better give me a lecture on Whitehorse oh. and the Yukon Territory. What do I know about the Yukon Territory? You could put in the bottom of a cocktail glass in Cal Miller's Star in, Lounge. In, in the in Capitol, the, in, on in the, Main Street. On Main Street. Was that where you spent all your time when you were up there in Rendezvous? No, I danced on the stage of the high school along with that gorgeous gal whose name I Jillian forget. Jillian Campbell. Jillian Campbell. Yes. I made a speech somewhere. Uh, I broadcast from the Star Lounge, which was an experience to behold, <laughs> and it was 33 below. It was 50 below there today. Vancouver weather looks rather good. Old people like us can't really stand it, can we? Well, we manage. It's, it's you know, it's a nice dry weather. Nice okay, tell me about the Yukon. I want a five-minute lecture from you about the Yukon. Oh, my. I couldn't. I don't know if I can give you one in five minutes. Okay. The mining business is booming. The mining business is booming. If you've got a gold claim, you're home free. You most definitely are at the prices of gold. Uh, but basically, you know, it's the best part of Canada. It really is. It's uh, certainly very much a part of Canada, but the very best, if not the best part of the world, the Yukon. Uh, the freedom, the open spaces, the individualism. Um, as you can see, I'm sold on the Yukon. I'm a fourth generation Yukoner. My, uh, my grandparents and great grandparents came up in, in uh, 1897 uh, in the gold rush. My mother was born in Dawson City. Uh, I was raised in a very small community, used to trap. My father was RCMP. And uh, the Yukon is just the greatest place on the world. You are a 100% Canadian from the frontier, a right. pioneer, and all that wonderful and, jazz. And Scottish Irish stock. Okay, let's go back to 1897. I wasn't around then. I know you weren't around <laughs> then. Who was it? You say fourth generation? Yes, my great grandfather and uh, four of his sons came in from New Brunswick for the gold rush. And two of those sons stayed. Uh, one eventually left, and the other with his wife, who was straight from Ireland, Belfast, Ireland, to Dawson City, uh, and never left for 45 years, uh, raised their family in Dawson, and um, they both passed away there and are still buried there. So you were born where? In Dawson Creek, actually. My mother, during the Depression, uh, just after she was married, went to Ottawa, of all places, and, um, she married a civil servant. Well, she married um, an RCMP. Oh, an RCMP. Right. That's not as bad as marrying a not, civil servant. Not no. quite. Not quite. And uh, then they started back to the Yukon. This, of course, at the beginning of the Depression. And they got into the Peace River country and decided they'd try farming. Uh, and they were not farmers. And then I came along and they said, look, this is time to go back to the Yukon. So at about six months old, we headed back to the Yukon. And uh, This time you went back to and then Dawson Creek. No, no, from Dawson, you know, we, I was born in Dawson Creek, and then we went back to Dawson, and my father was posted to Fort Selkirk, which uh, is a little tiny, doesn't exist anymore, it's a historic site, and that's where I was raised for 14 years, uh, the only child most of the time in the community, about 12 white people. Did you have your own tribe line? A little one, yeah, yeah, when I was small. Run with snares? Yes. Hunting track. for? For uh, rabbits mostly, for my dog and, and uh, my dog team and uh, squirrels, uh, the odd fox, things like that. For your dog team? Yeah, I had two dogs. Which you used to use a little sl sledge with? A little with? toboggan, yes. little toboggan mm -hmm. for your dog team. That's right. So and you hunting and... Uh, grew up and became a commissioner in the Yukon Territories. I became a, actually a juvenile court judge first, and then the mayor of the city of Whitehorse for two terms. And then last year I was appointed as the commissioner of the territory. Uh, unfortunately, events uh, transpired that uh, I resigned in October of this year, but uh, I've been very involved. Uh, I'm very dedicated to the Yukon, and I've been very involved with it. My family. And I'm very pleased to meet you because now we're in the Yukon mm -hmm. on a live, daily basis on and you the know, satellite. Jack, we want to welcome you, and I'd like to give you a Yukon flag to wear on your coat when you're when you're talking to Yukoners on this show, just so that we know you remember it, because oh. we really enjoy uh, your program. And, uh, I'm certainly different. And welcome. I'm not the kind of normal television you got on CBC, am I? You're a little bit like a Yukoner. You're an independent you individualist that says what he thinks. Loud, and, uh, charming, and occasionally brusque and rude. Loud, occasionally brusque and rude, uh, charming on occasions. <laughs>
handsome when I hold my chins. Yeah, well, we all have to do that when we get <laughs> over 40. I'm going to chat up Ion Christensen from the Yukon, from Whitehorse, until the end of the program after this break. Eoin Christensen from the Yukon, former Commissioner of the Territories. What are the growing pains that the Yukon suffers from, though, in your commission form of government? I presume you still have a partly elected, partly appointed body which runs the territory. Right. We're a territory as, as opposed to a province, which, um, which basically means we are governed under a Yukon Act uh, by the Minister of Indian uh, and Northern Affairs uh, from Ottawa with an appointed commissioner and under that uh, commissioner, there's the, the elected uh, body, the Legislative Assembly, which can, is comprised now of 16 members who run on party lines and, and represent ridings. Um, there have been some changes in the, in the last uh, few years in the evolution of, of more responsible government. Um, when I went into office in, in uh, January of last year, uh, my terms of reference were, were quite revolutionary. I was bound, the commissioner sits as, as sort of the premier of the province, a quasi-premier lieutenant governor. And I was bound by the direction of that elected council in all matters of which they had absolute jurisdiction. You were the commissioner? That's right. You were the, as you say, a cross between premier and That's lieutenant right. governor. You're appointed, you're not Queen, elected. Queen's representative That's appointed. Right. Mm -hmm. That's right. And, um, but I still had responsibilities um, and sort of the final uh, say, if you will, in financial matters because the territory uh, receives a, an outright deficit grant from the federal government in order to operate in areas of lands because as a territory we do not have the responsibility for our lands or non-renewable resources and in uh, native <coughs> affairs, Indian affairs, because of course the minister is still responsible there. And I sat as the chairman <coughs> of the executive committee or cabinet, if you will. Um, I went in in January, of course the election was called uh, early later on in that spring and we sort of lost a few months there and then our new, new government came in and a new minister and um, you know there, there was quite a few changes and uncertainties as people sort of geared up and, and uh, changed direction. In, these, in October the 10th, it was my birthday, I received my new terms of reference which uh, basically <coughs> gave me two, two distinct jobs. Uh, which I, I wasn't prepared to accept. One was the lieutenant governors uh, with no, uh, no, no direct say or, or involvement in the policy decision making. The other was a, an agent of change dealing with constitutional matters between the Indian people and their land claims and the elected territorial people. I saw the two jobs in conflict with each other and um, quit. I didn't want to be a lieutenant governor. I thought I was too young for that. So you just quit in a so snit? So I resigned. No, I didn't quit in a snit. I, was, I, um, I just felt that it was going a little too far too fast. I didn't feel that we were quite ready for that sort of a move. I took on the job with the express purpose of working myself out of a job in two to two and a half years. I oh, I can I understand your feeling of concern. You know, this is something that people in the South, now we are in the South. Mm -hmm. I often forget we're in the South, but this to you oh, is you're, the you're South. outside. <laughs> That's the way we refer We're outside. To it. You're outside. We're outside You're down in, there somewhere. in the south. That's right. In fact, you can get a better rate on a flight to Hawaii than I can. Because you're uh, closer to Hawaii. No, well, we <coughs> don't get a better rate, I'll tell you that right now. Because we have to get here first, then we get the rate from here over. Oh, I thought you got a rate from... I thought you got a better... Oh, because no, you don't no, fly no. direct. You'd no, have to go... It's no, the Americans and Alaska. Yeah, we have to come from, <coughs> to Vancouver. You see, the problem with this, the question of native settlements, I'd be the first to agree that the, the, what do you call them? Do you call them natives, Indians, Indians. aboriginals, Indians. or what? Indians. Any term you use, you seem to be insulting someone. You call them Indians. Right. We had an Indian settlement the other week, which I hope works out. 35 families, mm -hmm. 12 50. and a half million retroactive, mm -hmm. 50 million total 50 million. No real guidelines as to how it's to be cared for or controlled. No one dares say anything because Big Brother of the Indian Affairs Department fouled everything up so badly the last time mm -hmm. round. I'm concerned that it will be properly handled in the future. 
That is a concern. But uh, in, in the Yukon Territory, really, the number one problem, before we get into constitutional development or, or, or any type of development, is our land claims. Uh, the, the Indian people in the Yukon are in the minority. Um, they have a, a great fear of, of being assimilated and to lose their heritage, uh, which they have to a certain extent already lost. And until they can have some, some guarantees and a feeling of, of being part of that society, uh, we're going to run into nothing but problems. And that, uh, those claims, as far as I'm concerned, are really the number one problem that we have and the number one thing that has to be addressed and settled. Then we can get on with our development. Is there room for the non-Indian in the Yukon? There most certainly is. Oh, yes. Would most he be definitely. welcome? He certainly is. Uh, I mean, we all talk about this. I, so, I don't suppose a homogenous society is in any way possible. Uh, no, but I think people can learn to work and live together. I mean, uh, you know, you always have problems. You, you, it's idealistic to say that we brotherly love and, and harmony for all, but uh, you can learn to work together. But there must be massive settlements for the Aboriginal peoples of the North before there can be political peace and quiet. There has to be settlements. There has to be negotiated settlements. They don't necessarily have to be massive giveaways. See, that's my southern outside yes. thing, you see. And uh, I feel very strongly that the Indian people are realistic enough. At the, at the moment, we've been in six years in Indian land claims in the Yukon. And uh, as I read it, uh, we have never gone beyond the posturing stage. Uh, the negotiations have, have for either the Indian side, they have lost negotiators, they've had to go back to their people. On the federal government side, uh, there's been a change in government, they've changed their negotiators, and things have broken down okay. before they've got One into last the one. Now, I've been very nice to you this morning. Okay, be nice. Own, I've been nice. When you go back up there, uh, I does my PR. I may need some help up there to get a couple of people to watch. Don't you agree? Uh, no, you don't need any help. Don't any need help. any help. You don't. And if I need an interpreter, you will interpret my language to the guy that owns the department store. What's his I'll name? Do Hogan. The, Mr. Hogan, Ralph Hogan. Yes. Oh yeah, give him my warmest regards. All right, I shall. <laughs> <laughs> Private joke. I'll tell you about <laughs> it sometime. Hello, Ralphie boy. Nice to see you. Nice to be in your town, live and direct. Thanks, I own. Linda, after the break. Not a bad start to week. Tomorrow, Linda. Brian has a story on battered wives. With experts. Yes. In studio. Right. Happy and story. Andy Russell will be along at the end of the program. You know, the grizzly bear expert, Andy Russell. Big Andy. Mm -hmm. It should be good fun. Uh, federal election slow and whipping up, isn't it? Hopefully near the end of the week we'll start doing See, constituency. anybody cares? I'm beginning to wonder myself if anybody cares at all. Why not just stay away? 9 a.m. Don't stay away then. Tomorrow, precisely.